Good morning. That just kind of stops, doesn't it? It just kind of, boom, it's done. It is good to see you all here today. How are you all? Even you, Deacon Dave, I see you hiding back there, brother. It's hard to hide that dome we got. It's lovely. I love it, man. Love it. My name's Joel Slaughter, and I serve here as one of the elders. And today I'll be <clears throat> leading in the second of a five-part series entitled From the Heart. It's just a time where the elders can come and just share with you what's on our, our mind and what's on our heart. And, uh, you know, it's my desire today that you guys are encouraged by what I have to share <clears throat> and also challenged, challenged a bit by what I talk about, which is going to be the future. So I don't know about that future. I don't know if you think about it too much, but, you know, that future, if you really think about it, it's a breath away and yet it's eternity away. And that is a huge amount of time and space. And I think, um, you know, if you ask me, my desire would be to have my future better than my past. I don't know about you guys. And I think what we drew is we actually take that near future that's really close to us and we try and manipulate it a little bit. We try and control it, make that future what we want. But I think as we look at today and all the issues that we face as a nation, the issues we face on the international level, the separation and polarization of, of people, the polarization and the, of ideologies and the anger and the angst, and you look at the headlines, and sometimes we ask, if I could click it, where's our hope? Sometimes it comes to the point to me when I look at it and I go, where is my hope when it gets so bad? And that's what we're going to talk about today. We're going to talk about the future in terms of hope. And so I'm going to ask four questions today. Where does hope come from is the first one. The second one is, what is hope? The third question is, how does this hope manifest in our life? And the fourth one is, what do we do with this hope? What do we do with this hope? So as we start, I just want to pray real quick, and then we'll move right into the teaching time. Father, we praise you for the creation, the fact that you created time and space, and Father, you gave us the understanding of um, eternity. You've placed that in our heart. And Father, we just thank you for the plan that you've given us of salvation, and we can live a life that has a future and a hope. And I pray as we talk about that today, there'll be a just an understanding of what you want us to do, Father. And I pray these things in your son's name. Amen. So first question, <clears throat> where does hope come from? I think if you really, those of us that actually believe God's word is truth, it's kind of an easy question. It comes from God. And just to confirm that, just a couple of passages to get us going. Blessed be the God. This is from 1 Peter 1, 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his mercy has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. We can see that our hope, our living hope, comes when we are born again. The second is found in 2 Thessalonians 2, 16. Now may our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God our Father who has loved us and given us eternal comfort and good hope by grace. That passage goes on, but we can see here that we, he, God has given us good hope. Now I'm going to tell you, I think there's people that would sit down and tell us today that hope can be man-made. That there are people that have such a positive attitude about life that they can actually take that, that positive attitude and push it into the future and actually say that anything comes, that comes good is that's my hope, that's what happened. I don't think that's sustainable, but I, pe I think people try to do that. Now, those of us like me who don't have a glass to be half full, I think we sometimes will take our hope and place it on a person, maybe a political figure. Maybe a, a singer, a famous singer, or maybe a famous athlete. That's where our hope lies. Or maybe even we'll put it in a thing like our 401K or our job or maybe our favorite football team. 
So I think those out there, but I think our, 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 our God will tell us about that too. And in Ephesians 2.12, he says, Remember that you were at times separate from Christ, excluded from the commonwealth of Israel, and strangers to covenant of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. I think this tells us right now, if you do not know God, if you do not have Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, there is no hope. And 1 Thessalonians tells us, But we do not want you to be uninformed, brethren, about those who are asleep, so that you will not grieve as do the rest who have no hope. That rest, again, is those who don't believe in Jesus Christ. So those who don't have God, those who not have been born again, do not have hope. Our hope comes from God. I think we need to understand that there's a little bit more to that. I think our hope actually is generated by God's plan, purpose, and will. And I think that's evident as we look at this next passage in Jeremiah 29:11. I think this is a passage that we all know, we've all read, we've all seen. I think it's in some of our lives, it's one that we've chosen as our, you know, it's our life verse. I'm going to claim that. I'm going to cling to that. And I know it wasn't written directly to the New Testament church or us as believers today, yet I think there's application that we can, an observation application we can take from that says, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans for welfare and not calamity to give you a future and a hope. It's really simple, but I want to point out a couple of things. The plans I have for you. That's, this is God's plan. Okay, there's, this is not my plan. This is God's plan. Okay. And God's plan at the end is a future and a hope. And I believe that this says that God's plan for us is generated by his plan, his purpose, and his will that we may have a future and a hope. You might sit down and say, well, if that's true, Joel, what's God's will? That's a broad topic, which we won't get into today, but I want you to understand that there are several passages in the New Testament that actually say <clears throat> for this is the will of God, or so is the will of God. And I want to point out three of those this morning because I think they have everything to do with our future and our hope. And the first one is found in John 6.40. John 6.40, it says, God wants our salvation. He wants us to know him. He wants us to believe in him. He wants us to be made righteous by the blood of Jesus Christ by his death, burial, and resurrection. God wants us to be saved. The second in this is our sanctification found in 1 Thessalonians 4, 3. God wants us to be holy as he is holy. God wants us to be transformed, conformed to the image of Christ through the power of his Holy Spirit as we abide in his word on a consistent basis. God wants us to be like Christ. And the last one here, our suffering, found in 1 Peter 3, 17. Now, I'm, I'm, I'm probably pretty sure I had you at the first two, right? This one's a little different. And I know I spend a lot of time right now with uh, the young adults, and we talk about this, and I know they're rolling their eyes right now saying, we've got to go with this again. But I think it's important to understand that. And I want you to understand also that this suffering isn't about a wrathful God who wants to punish his children for disobedience. This is about a loving God, a loving God that wastes nothing and uses everything for his glory. And he uses suffering in our life to refine our character. I want you to look at this real quick. Our salvation flows right into our sanctification, and our suffering is created by, our sanctification is created by our suffering. All of that works together to create in us that will of us to be more like Christ. God's plan, not necessarily my plan. Let me give you an example. And I think God works through our suffering really so that we choose his will over ours. 
And I think that's an important thing to understand because as we look at Jesus as our example, I want you to point out, I want to point out in when he was, on the night he was betrayed, he went to the garden to pray. And he prayed this. He said, Lord, if there's any other way this, this cup could pass, please let's figure this out. The human side of him was struggling with the death on the cross. The human side didn't really want to go through with this. The God side knew it had to be done, but he sat there and said, God, please, let's figure this out and do it again. Just do it somehow. He chose God's will over his own in that moment. And through that suffering of Jesus Christ, he went to the cross, pleased God, glorified God, and in so doing, he allowed us to be saved created the process for us to be sanctified through his suffering. Amen. Scripture even says that God was pleased to crush him. And we sit down and say, what a horrible thing to say. But I think what what the writer meant in that was actually God was so pleased that Jesus would actually choose God's will over his own. He was so pleased that the plan was still intact. So where does our hope come from? It comes from God. It is generated by his plan, his purpose, and his will. So what's point? Question number two. Well, I left that up there a long time. Question number two. What is hope? What is hope? Let's go to our passage today. It's in Romans. I love, this is one of my favorite passages even since I was a young kid. Um, And Romans, a great letter about justification, about the gospel, how it works. And in this one, verse 5, chapter 5, 1 through 5, Paul writes this, Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom also we have obtained our introduction by faith into this grace in which we stand. And we exult in hope of the glory of God. And not only this, but we exult in our tribulations, knowing that tribulation brings about perseverance. And perseverance, proven character, and proven character, hope. And hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out within our hearts through the Holy Spirit who was given to us. Now, hope is used in here three times. I underline two, but that word hope in Greek, and again, I'm not a Greek expert, but I I do have tools is el peace. Hope is el peace in Greek. And that actually the definition of that is the expectant, the expectation of good, a joyful and confident expectation of eternal salvation. Great definition. But I think as we take that word and actually superimpose it over all of Scripture, there's something that's a little deeper, a little more meaningful. And I want to share that with you. Hope is the expectation that the promises of God are in the process of being fulfilled. Amen. There you go. The expectation that the promises of God are in the process of being fulfilled. Now, I'm going to leave that up there for you. I think just for a minute as I go, I'm going to look at Romans again. But in the first four chapters of Romans, Paul sets up a great defense for justification by faith and not of works. And in that, he uses Abraham as an example. Abraham received the promises. The promises Abraham received were descendants, land, uh, what are they? Land and a nation and the fourth one, blessing. There you go. You get up here and your just head just goes flying off the rails. Thank you. Those are the promises. That's Abraham. And Paul uses him in his example, and he comes up in verse... Four, th- or chapter 4, verse 3 says, Abraham believed God, and it was reckoned to him as righteousness. We all know that. Great passage. Let me ask you this. What did Abraham believe in? If you ask me what I believe in today, I would sit down and say, I believe in Jesus Christ. I believe that Jesus Christ was the Son of God, came here as the perfect sacrifice for my sin, died on the cross, was buried, resurrected, and because of that, I believe in him for my eternal salvation. I believe in Christ. What did Abraham believe in? 
Paul makes this great comment in Romans 4.18. He says that in hope against hope, Abraham believed. The only thing Abraham to believe in were those promises that God gave. That was it. The promises are going to come true, Abraham. Do you believe me? Do you believe me? And in two, two verses later, we see that yet with respect to the promise of God, he did not waver in unbelief, but grew strong in faith, giving glory to God. I want to point out a, just a little bit of a, a pattern here. We believe in that promise, but the promises are out there. The God's will is out there. God's plan is out there. Do we waver? If we believe and don't waver, we continue on with the promises that God has promised. If we continue on with God's will, that will give God glory. That's the pattern. That's the pattern. So, question number one, where does, where does our hope come from? It comes from God. It comes from it's generated by his plan, his purpose, and his will. What is hope? It is the expectation that the promises of God are in the process of being fulfilled. Now, what does that have to do with my life? How does that hope manifest in my life every day? <clears throat> Let's go back to our passage here. You notice... I hope it's mentioned twice. I have that up there before. There seems to be a, a um, point of hope in the distant future, closer to the eternity side. There's another one that's more closer to us in time. It's a little more temporal. And I think Paul makes the comment here that even though there's two, we're supposed to respond to both of them the same way. We're to exalt. Exalt. That means what? That means we're excited. That means a genuine excitement. That means a joy. In some of your Bibles, it may say rejoice. But do I really exult? And what is that really? You know, I looked at that for quite a while. And as we look at that word in, in Greek, and there's, there's this, um, the root words of that are, are kind of interesting. It's to boast and to glory in. And I was like, well, how does that result in exult? Let me give you an example. Um, Six-year-old little boy, kindergarten age, found out that his class, the next um, field trip that they take is going to be at the fire station. And this kid is off the rails excited. He is going, oh, my gosh. We should go to the fire station. I want to be a fireman when I grow up. I can't believe it. We're going to go to this place. It's going to be great. Telling all his friends, this is wonderful. And then he finds out that it's the fire station where his dad is located. And he's like, oh, my gosh, this is going to be awesome. My dad's going to be there. I love my dad. He's going to show us exactly what all this is about. He's going to let us wear his hat. He's going to put us on the fire engine. We're going to do all this stuff. It's going to be great. And I'm going to boast in my dad, and I'm going to glory in my dad. I'm exulting in my dad. That's exactly what God wants us to do when we talk about this hope. What has my God done? Where is he? And what is he doing in my life? That's what it means to exult. So let's take a look at how this works. Exult in hope of the glory of God. What does that really mean? What does that really mean? I mean, what it is, is we're going to be in heaven. <laughs> we are going to be in heaven. The promise that was made was by Jesus as he was bidding farewell to his disciples in the last few chapters of John, he was sitting there saying, do not let your heart be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house, there are many dwellings. If it were not so, I would have told you. For I go to prepare a place for you. If I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. Let me point this out. He's going to prepare a place for us in heaven. He's going to come back for us. He's going to bring us back with him. We're going to be with him and God forever in heaven. 
Let me add something else to you. 1 Corinthians 15, behold, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep, but we will be changed. In the moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised imperishable, and we will be changed. For this imperishable must put on the imperishable, and this mortal must put on the immortality. And we highlight these. We will be changed. This cruddy body that we live in, this, this tent that is full of sin is going to be gone. I will be like Christ. We will stand in front of God Almighty with bodies that are like Jesus, and we will be, don't have to hide because of all the sin, and we can share heaven with God Almighty. If that's not something to hope for, I don't know what we're talking about. And sometimes I look at my wife and say, you know what, babe, I'm ready to go now. I'm tired of the weeds. I'm tired of the flat tires. I'm tired of the crap. But that's not right, is it? There's some other stuff we need to take care of. I've come to the belief that if we are still alive, that God has purpose left in our body for this world. And we need to understand what that is. But let's go to the next one. We exult in our tribulations knowing that tribulation brings about perseverance and perseverance, proven character and proven character hope. I love all that. Give me some of that. I think if you look at that, there is a lot of stuff in the way to get to that temporal hope, if you want to call it that. There is stuff like tribulation, perseverance. Mm -mm. That's hard, God. I think you've all heard the adage, life is hard, and if you look at this, the life of a believer is even almost more difficult. I think the, the thing about that is, is God knows that. God knows that our life is hard. God knows that he's asked us to do a lot of stuff. And so he's actually given us the capacity. He's given us the capacity to look into the future with a vision of hope that God's plan is intact of making me like Christ, making us like Christ. What does he give us? God gives us peace. You know, that I don't know what world you guys live in, but my world is like grab the tiger and hold on all day because it's going to be like craziness. And you get people calling you here and doing this and do this and now this. And oh, by the way, you don't do it like that. You don't do it like, would you stop and give me some peace, God? I want you to understand this peace is... A calmness, it is tranquility, but it's not just on the outside, it's on the inside. There, when we have been justified in Christ, we are one with him, and that oneness, that creates a completeness. We are complete in him. And in that completeness, we can understand that the plan he's working on is intact. My plans are out the window, but God's plans haven't changed. He wants me to be sanctified. And as I understand that, I can say, okay, I get that. I can, I can be calm. He also gives us grace. Now, I think a lot of us think that grace, that saving grace is a one-time shot. We've been saved by God's grace. Boom, we're done. No. That grace we stand in, this is positional, which we stand in. Jesus is before God Almighty pleading for our case every day to say, God, give them the stuff they need to accomplish the task you've given them. Fill them with the power to choose you. Give them the stuff they need. Supply their needs. And we on earth, I get this picture here, we're standing in, it's knee deep. We're standing in God's grace and that grace is, you know what that, it's my home. God gave me my home. God gave me a job. God gave me a bank account. God gave us the ability to hear. I can walk. I can see. He's given us so much. And you know what? I look around and go, well, look what I've done. Look what I've done. I got that job. No, God did that. God gives us grace day by day to, fill, to fulfill the plan he has for us. Another thing he gives us, not to say the least, the Holy Spirit. You know, the interesting thing about the Holy Spirit is that 
When Jesus was saying farewell to his disciples, he promised the helper. The promised helper is the Holy Spirit, who is our comforter, who is our teacher, who is our enlightener, who is our... He administers peace. He administers grace. He does all this stuff and more. He gives us the capacity to choose God's will over ours. He gives us the ability through his power to change and day by day, chip by chip, become more like Christ. What a gift that God has given us. What capacity he's given us to have a vision of hope that's in the future. Yet here we are. We exult in our tribulations knowing that tribulation brings about perseverance and perseverance, proven character and proven character hope. I still don't like it. I um, <clears throat> I think we need to understand one thing. This is God's plan. You know, that's hard to really comprehend. This is God's plan. I think one of the things I, um, I like to do as I start working in a passage in my, in my time with God, I'll sit there and I'll read through it and then I'll come back and I'll actually write a paraphrase. I'll just write what God's telling me about this. I mean, I don't have to, I don't have to study it. I don't have to do anything. I'm just saying, God, tell me what this is talking about. And I did that with this passage. When I started working through this, I did that. And I just want to read this for you. <clears throat> this is his plan. Trials, troubles, tribulation always surround us. They come. Pressure builds. Fear, worry, anxiety, and doubt overwhelm us. And we suffer. But as we engage the Holy Spirit, he gives us strength to endure under that pressure, that word means, that word perseverance means to bear up under. So he gives us the strength to endure under that pressure and gives us the power to choose God's plan, God's will over our own. Then, after a little while, the pain and suffering will diminish. And we will stand approved by God with a refined character. And God is pleased and glorified. Then we understand the promises of God are being fulfilled and we have hope. He gives us everything we need. Do we believe that? Or is, do you believe this or is this just words on paper? Because tomorrow is going to come. So, what happens when my business of 22 years is destroyed within a week in one meeting without any prior warning? What do I do? What happens when the plans, my plans, for a solid future are swept away by one person's decision? What do I do? What happens when my financial stability is replaced by insecurity and doubt? What do I do? I listen. I listen. The Holy Spirit was given to us so we could actually understand God's Word, and I sit there and say, please, God, please tell me what I'm supposed to do. Help me understand all this, everything's crashing down around me. What do I do? Am I going to have a job next week? Am I going to have money in the bank? Am I going to have this stuff? Please help me understand this. I don't understand. And as my, all these plans I built crashing around, you know what the Holy Spirit tells me is, Joel, the plan hadn't changed. <laughs> Joel, stop. My plan is still intact. Heaven is there. Tomorrow is there. And we are slowly making you into the image of Christ. 
So I read more, and I sit there and say, God, it just doesn't make sense. Please give me the peace to understand what's going on. I just don't get it. And he reminds me the fact that, Joel, you're completing me. I am surrounding you with my power and strength to support you one more day so you can understand what you're supposed to do for me and my kingdom. And the peace comes. And then I look at the grace. I sit there and say, God, I don't, I can't do this. I'm looking at, I don't have enough in the back. I don't have this. I don't have a job. I don't have these things. And you know what, God, one by one, in his timing, they're supplied piece by piece. God wants me to make it one more day for his purpose, for his plan, for his glory to become more and more like Christ. And you know what? As that kept coming, I'm still here. <laughs> We're still here. I know I'm not the only one that has trials. We all suffer. But the question is, do we believe God's plan is true? So how does hope manifest in our life? Sometimes the hope is all we have. Just ask Abraham. That's all he had. Do we believe it? Do we believe God is making us into his image? Do we believe that God has heaven set aside for us? Do we believe that God is going to supply all our needs? Yes. Hope is all we have. And that's how it manifests. So the next one, last question. What do we do with this hope? What is it that we do with it? You know, I think the, the last part of this passage is, oh, yeah, I forgot. I, I, it didn't disappoint. <laughs> hope doesn't disappoint. I believe it will if we put it in something other than Christ. But as we start this last point, the love of God has been poured out within our heart. We have a vertical relationship that God is just, I, I get this picture that God is through his the Holy Spirit is just pouring love out. And he said, Joel, you're a little low. Here's, here's some more. <laughs> Poured it in there. Okay. He gets, and he gets it and it starts to overflow and it flows over and flows over and it actually spills out from coming down and goes horizontal. And I seek out those people that are around me that need to be ministered to, those people we talked about at the beginning that don't know God, that don't have hope. And the bottom line is we share that hope with those people that don't have it. And I love this passage. This is another one I like in 1 Peter 3, 14 through 15. But even if you should suffer for the sake of righteousness, you're blessed. And do not fear their intimidation and do not be troubled. But sanctify Christ as Lord in your hearts, always being ready to make a defense to everyone who asks you to give an account of the hope that is in you. Yet with gentleness and reverence, and I'll just highlight these. I probably should have highlighted suffer. I didn't. Um, but do you see the pattern is still intact? That pattern we talked about, suffer, sanctification, hope, it's the process. It's God's plan. And the question is, do we choose God's plan or my plan every day? I think the interesting thing about this is that um, I told a couple of people after the last uh, sermon or the last um, worship time, this is not where I planned on this, this sermon to go. It was, it was somewhere totally different. But as I went through it, this is kind of what came out. It's kind of interesting how God just changed the way and it's like had, you know, flipped it all around and did some stuff. And actually this share of hope in Christ is actually part of our church. It's what we do here. It's who we are. It's in our DNA. As God grows, a, our church is as God's growing church family, proclaiming the good news of Jesus, all to the glory of God. This is what we do. We engage God's truth. We pursue life together. And what? We're sharing hope in Christ. That's what we do. This is who we are. This is what God wants us to be. I even tried to go a different direction. God said, nope, Joe, this is what we're going to do. Boom. 
This is it. So, if you have your connection cards, you know, we've, we announce this every week. You know, this is a time where you can put down your prayer request, which the staff loves to spend praying over, and we do. It's also a time where you can check the boxes, which we're getting ready to go do that, of how you digest or how you perceive this, this time in the Word. But if you remember, I started this lesson or this time teaching with two things, that you're encouraged, which I hope you have been, but two, that you are challenged with your future. And I want to challenge you right now. This, um, this card is not just a time where you can put down prayer requests. It's not just a time where you can check off these boxes to say, pray for me that I would do this. This is also a chance for you to tithe. I will tell you this. If you want to choose or get in the habit of choosing God's will over your own will, if you do not tithe, tithe, and I guarantee you, you will be challenged. And if you tithe, tithe more, because God's will will challenge us when it starts talking about money. So be challenged. But as we go into this, I also want you to understand that there are next steps. And the first next step here is pray that I will understand God's plan for my life for the near temporal and the distant eternal future. They're the, they're the same hope. It's God's plan. He wants us to know him. He wants us to be like Christ. And that process is through his power, his suffering. Second step is pray that I choose to follow God's plan and not my plan as I live through my daily trials and tribulations. I know that everybody in here loves to be trial, go through trials and tribulation. I want to encourage you, do not bail out. God's plan is for you to endure underneath it, bear up underneath it. The power of the Holy Spirit has all the capacity to bring you to the next day with exactly what God wants you to do. Do not bail out on God's plan. Number three, pray that I will employ God's promise of his Holy Spirit into my day, everyday life as I abide in his word daily. I want to tell you guys, guys something. This is the fulcrum that makes all of this work. Our responsibility as believers in Jesus Christ is to daily, consistently go to the word and ask the Holy Spirit to enlighten us, to understand how God wants us to be that day. The next day, the day after that, change me into the image of Christ. And four, pray that the love of God would so overwhelm me that I am compelled to share the hope that is within me to those that are around me. There's a lot of me in that in there. But I want you to understand, I'm asking God to change me, fill me with that love that compels me to go touch those people that don't know, that don't have a shred of hope. Pray those things. We'll pray for you. So I want you to na na right now, just take a minute, fill that out. And the ushers will come in just a second. And you know, it's been great being here with you all today. Be blessed and have a great week.